טוב, המעצה הראשונה שלנו היום זאת פרופסור ברברה קירשנבלד גימבלט מבית ספר לאומנויות בניו יורק. ברברה מחברת הרבה ספרים רבים על הנושאים היהודים, וזו גם על היהודים פולנים. הייחודיות של ברברה היא גישתה אינטרדיסציפלינרית לכל הנושא הזה. שימשה כיועצת להרבה פרויקטים מוזרים בכל העולם, גם בבית התפוצות שבתל אביב, במוזיאון יהודי בברלין, הולוקאוסט מוזיאום בוושינגטון, and many many others as I learned. Also by the way, the memorial of 11th of September. בשנת 2006 היא קיבלה על עצמה את התפקיד הובלה והקמת תערוכת קפואה של מוזיאון לתולדות יהודי פולין בפולין. בוורשה. ברבה, you are I would like to thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you the Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews. I especially want to thank uh, the Masua Center. I'd like to thank also the Polish Institute. Um, and this is really a, a great opportunity for us to introduce you to a, a wonderful new, uh, I would say, attraction destination in Poland. And I think that it will greatly enrich and expand enlighten and deepen the experience of those who come to Poland who are interested in the history of Polish Jews but also in commemorating the Holocaust. Uh, I begin here. During our grand opening, which was October 28th in 2014, so it was only three months ago, um, Arnold Eisen, the Chancellor of the Theological Seminary of America, wrote um, after he had visited the museum. It's not often that a museum makes history as well as chronicles it, and rare too when otherwise cautious observers remark at the opening of a new museum that it may prove a source of hope and pride that propels an entire society forward. Both of those things happened this week in Warsaw with the opening of Pauline Museum. And that's, that's really an extraordinary statement. And I believe that museums, if they're to really fulfill their mission, must be agents of transformation. They must move a society forward. And I believe that that's what this institution here, where we're gathered today, that I believe is your mission, and that is our mission. This is where Pauline Museum is standing. This is the rubble of the Warsaw Ghetto after the Germans suppressed the Warsaw Ghetto uprising and destroyed the entire ghetto. This is also where, before the war, the largest Jewish community in Europe lived. A third of the population of Warsaw, a third of the population was Jewish. 3,300,000 Jews living in Poland before the Holocaust. And it is here on the rubble that we have created this museum. And this is for us a very iconic uh, image because it tells you that we were starting from scratch. We didn't start with an historic building. We didn't start with a collection. We started with a story. That's what we have, a incredible story, a story of a thousand years, a story that has been largely overshadowed, understandably, by the catastrophic events of the Holocaust, but a vital, vital part of the story. The story is not complete without this thousand-year picture, and it's precisely here. Five years on the fifth anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the monument to the ghetto heroes was mounted and unveiled on the rubble of the ghetto. And you can see, um, five years later, the, the rubble is still there. In fact, for decades, the rubble was there. When a city collapses, virtually collapses, and something like 70, 80% of the city of Warsaw was destroyed after the Warsaw Uprising, you can well imagine. And this, this monument 
is the defining moment, and it's what defines the site. We are a site-specific museum. We are sitting on the site of the Warsaw Ghetto, and we are specifically sitting in relationship to the monument commemorating the uprising. On one side, showing the heroic military uprising, and on the other side, showing the great deportation of more than 300,000, ultimately uh, much more than 300,000 Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto to Treblinka. The idea for the museum arose in 1993 uh, with the opening of the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And the thought was that if there's a Holocaust Museum in Washington, there should be a museum of the history of Polish Jews in Poland. Because in a sense, the last thing that Poland needed was a museum of the Holocaust. In a sense, all of Poland is already a Holocaust museum in the sense that Poland was the epicenter of the genocide. Poland is where the Germans built death camps. This is where the Jews, not only of Poland, but also of Europe, were brought to their death. And so to create a museum of the history of Polish Jews was an extremely important, I think a very, very powerful idea. But this was an initiative not of the state, not of the city, not of the ministry. It was an initiative that came from a Jewish NGO, a Jewish nonprofit that was established in Poland just after the war. It was the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute of Poland that has under its umbrella two institutions, the Jewish Historical Institute with its archive, its museum collection, its research, and its library, and Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews. The city of Warsaw gave the land, and you can see that it was strategically, it is strategically cited here in relationship to the monument, which I'll show you in just a moment. <coughs> And it was not until 2005 that the association was able to create a private, unique private-public partnership with the city of Warsaw and the Ministry of Culture and National Heritage, a unique public-private partnership to create a cultural institution in Poland. And the division of labor was that the city and the ministry would pay for the building and oversee its construction, and that the association of the Jewish Historical Institute of Poland would create the exhibition, produce the exhibition, and raise the funds for it, which was also a very unique development for a cultural institution. And so, um, in 2005, with the agreement signed, the museum formed, and the international architectural competition, the first successful one for a public building in Poland, we have this beautiful building standing in relation to the monument, and we believe that this, this particular architectural submission won. It is a submission by Rainer Machlamaki, a Finnish architect. And we believe that it won because of its respectful relationship to the monument. Where the monument was quite monumental in its day. And today, of course, uh, you can imagine that a great building could easily overshadow it. It's a beautifully minimalist on the exterior. There's a wonderful glass facade, which in a sense dematerializes the building. But it stands, this relationship is the defining relationship of this museum because until we opened the building in 2003, it's okay. it's okay? Until we opened the building in 2003, we honored those who died by going to the monument and remembering how they died. But with the opening of the building, we can complete the task of memory and we see the museum as completing the memorial complex that now we can also go to the museum to honor those who died by remembering how they lived and how they lived for a thousand years. Because it's extremely important from our point of view to remember them, not only the three million Polish Jews, the six million European Jews who died, but also the world that disappeared with them. And to recover that world and to transmit it to future generations, we consider a moral obligation. The glass fins lining the building on the outside have inscribed on them the word Pauline in Hebrew letters and also in Latin letters, referring to the beautiful legend as retold by Agnon of how Jews came to Poland and why they stayed and how from a Jewish legendary perspective Poland got its name. And so this is the other side of the building, which is the largest glass window in Poland, I think as beautiful and as uh, powerful as the front. And so this minimalist exterior 
purposely, uh, if you will, modest in relation to the monument, has a very dramatic in uh, interior that's inspired actually by the uh, canyons um, and uh, the rock formations of the Judean desert, by the beautiful stone of Jerusalem. It's a building made of glass, it's transparent, translucent, it's luminous, it's open, it's a very, I would say, um, warm and inviting. And it's, in essence, from my point of view, it's a message of hope. And I think it's extraordinary to create a glass building on a site of genocide. I think that it is a message that this museum completes the memorial complex. It is not a Holocaust museum. The Holocaust is an extremely important part of the story. It's the single largest gallery in the, eight, in the um, seven historical galleries of this 1,000 year history. But this is a, a museum that recovers and transmit and communicates the world that was created by Polish Jews in the course of a thousand years. When you are in the building itself, you enter the, the, you enter the exhibition from the main hall. And because the exhibition was in fact designed before the building and before there was a museum, we were able to give the master plan for the exhibition to the architect and to uh, ask that the two requirements be met. One, a respect for relationship to the monument, to the Warsaw, to the ghetto heroes, and the other, uh, that, that this, this uh, building would accommodate a multimedia narrative exhibition. We think of our exhibition more as a theater of history than as, a, as vitrines of objects, although objects, of course, will play an important role. And this is important. In a sense, I think that the uh, most important, in fact, the pioneering multimedia narrative museum is Beretz Wutzot in Tel Aviv, and he, uh, here. Uh, the work of Sheikha Weinberg, uh, real, a real pioneer in the creation of this kind of museum, and also a person who was instrumental in the conception of Pauline Museum's core exhibition. He was also very important in the development of the core exhibition at the Jewish Museum in Berlin. Now, a theater of history means that we put the story first, and that what we want to do is to immerse our visitors in the story as a seamless visual narrative. It's a very unusual and very, very special experience. The exhibition is on one level. It's the whole footprint of the building. And because the building was created for the exhibition, it's actually very, very easy to navigate. And so essentially, you come down those stairs that I showed you earlier into a poetic forest, which is, if you will, time before time, a space of historical imagination, through the medieval gallery, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth period, the long 19th century, the interwar years, a double height Holocaust gallery, the post-war years, and into a circulation space, and then up into the building itself. We are an educational and cultural center with a full education center, a 480-seat state-of-the-art auditorium, two screening rooms, and a, a wonderful facility for educational programs, seminars, workshops, conferences, with a restaurant with the capacity to provide kosher meals, and also uh, with a resource center um, and a museum shop. It's really a full service, complete, um, a complete institution. What I'd like to do now is to give you a walkthrough of the exhibition and to say that uh, we have a small, we have an audio guide, we have a mini guide, we uh, obviously are training guides uh, here in Israel to guide in Hebrew, uh, we can guide in other languages as well. And um, it is possible and in fact m many of our visitors come and they have a very compact, I would say, visit in two hours. But there are other visitors who are deeply interested, who spend a lot more time in the exhibition. They either spend half a day or a whole day. Uh, in one case, um, 24 hours, not all at the same time. Uh, others have come and really given themselves over gallery by gallery by gallery. So it will, would very much depend on an itinerary, on the interest of visitors, I think also in the nature of the group, as to how long to spend. Less than two hours, I think, would be quite frustrating. So. Keep that in mind, and when you see the, the depth and the richness of the exhibition, you'll get a sense of uh, what a visit might be like. <clears throat> and we have also have an audio guide, uh, I think I may have mentioned. And so we come down a grand set of stairs into our opening experience, which is intended to prepare the visitor for this 1,000-year journey. And it begins in a forest 
with the story of Jews, um, if you will, in the medieval period, fleeing persecution in Western Europe, coming east, finding themselves in a forest, and uh, according to the legend, whether it's as told by Peretz or by Agnon or by Bader or by, by any of uh, the others who have told this story uh, many, many times, either the clouds broke, an angel's hand pointed, and they heard the word Pauline, which they heard as Hebrew, rest here, or it might be that the birds were chirping, or a page of the Gemara were floating down, or Hebrew was uh, carved onto the trees, and those Jews who came in search of a safe haven and a place to settle decided that this was the place, and here they stayed, and in some of the legends, the, um, the final line is, and, and here we shall stay until the Messiah comes, which of course is a very, very long time. We enter the first historical gallery, the medieval period, and the medieval period extends from about 960 until about 1507. Why so precise? <clears throat> the reason is that um, the earliest mention of the territory that we know as Poland, known in the Middle Ages as the land of Mieszko, the earliest known existing reference to it in a text is in fact in the travel account of Ibrahim Ab Ibn Yaqub, a Jew from Cordoba, sent by the Caliph on a diplomatic mission across Europe, and who got as far as Prague, but heard about the market in Krakow, and heard about the land of Mieszko. And so Polish school children encountered until recently uh, Jews in their historical narrative twice. Ibrahim Ibn Jakob, because that's where Poland was first mentioned, and the Holocaust. And we'd like to think that with the Museum of the History of Polish Jews, we can fill in the gap between 960 and 1944, 1945, and also bring the story up to the present. You'll also notice that one of the things that we do is to quote from authentic primary sources in the original language, and we start our story with his travel account, which is dated with his travels around more or less 960. We look at the relationship of Jews and the ruler, Jews and the church, but the main question that we ask is why did Jews come, why did they stay, and what developed over the course of almost 600 years? More than half of the thousand year period is in the very first gallery. And what's interesting about this gallery, um, among other things, is that for this 600 period, we have exactly, we have, there is in the world exactly two objects that were made in Poland that had to do with Jews or were made by Jews. Two objects. Coins, bracteates, one-sided coins with Hebrew inscriptions that may have maybe the name of the ruler and bracha v'hatzlacha or some other kind of blessing on the ruler. And tombstones, Jewish tombstones, the earliest, earliest of which I think is 1203 from Wrocław. And so how do you make how do you make a story of 600 years with coins and tombstones? Well, what we did, because ours is a, an exhibition where the story comes first, is that we tell the story and we have created a hand-painted, hand-gilded medieval gallery. The whole gallery is painted by hand, based on medieval illustrations, working with comic book artists that illustrated our stories and with conservators of the painted interiors of Polish churches who hand painted and hand gilded the walls. So it's a very, very beautiful, very calm, and very, I would say, um, rich, a uh, feeling of rich, richness of materials and color, as well as interactivity. Now in that first gallery, from a few traveling merchants that came and went, by 1507, Jews are living in about 100 places with Jewish communities in about half of them, with the Jewish population estimated at about 20,000. That took 600 years. And so, and, uh, the, and you can see here we have, uh, particularly for younger visitors, beautiful interactivity, multimedia, but within this hand-painted environment. When we cross the threshold between the medieval gallery and the Commonwealth period, this is, this is the period of 1569 until 1772. So it's quite, it's a, it's a 200 year period. And it's the period of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth when this country was perhaps the largest in Europe, if we don't count Russia, and one of the most diverse and one of the most religiously tolerant. And so the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth included what is today Ukraine, Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, Belor Belarus, and various other uh, parts of other countries around. And it was, from the perspective of Polish history, a golden age, but also from the perspective of Jewish history, 
in many ways a golden age also because the center of the Ashkenazi Jewish world shifted from the Rhineland and from Western Europe to Poland. And if by the 1507, we know it from a document, we have about 20,000 Jews in this territory. By 1765, we've got 750,000 Jews living here in more than 1,100 locations. And so the task here is to communicate the rise of Jewish civilization in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the rise of rabbinical authority, Hebrew and Yiddish printing, uh, Jewish communal autonomy, not only the Kehilla, but also the uh, regional Vod, the national Vod, and to do it through beautiful multimedia and also all kinds of opportunities to explore not only religious tolerance, but also religious conflict, um, uh, the relationship of Jews to the church and to Christians, as well as economic opportunities and the role of Jews in relation to the economy. Our beautiful uh, library is dedicated to the earliest Hebrew and Yiddish books printed in the Commonwealth with opportunities to actually explore them through digital media. Um, and then the role of Jews in the economy taking uh, the, town of Z the beautiful town of Zamosh, which I think should be on every itinerary, an incredibly beautiful town, very diverse, and where Jews played a vital role in the economy of the rural estates of the nobility. A uh, break, if you will, a kind of a caesura, a critical moment in this history comes in 1648-1649 with the Khmelnytsky uprising. We've created a kind of corridor of fire, and it's an uprising that emerges from tensions between the Ukrainian peasantry and the Jew, the, the, the if you will, the Jewish middlemen and uh, land, uh, if you will, estate. Uh, sisters to the no nobility, to the nobility, and there is this uprising, which, as you know, is remembered in Jewish memory as the worst catastrophe between the destruction of the temple and the, and the Holocaust. It was a brutal, brutal, brutal uprising. A third of the Jewish population was killed. Many Jews fled. Others were forced to convert, and it is, is really remembered as a terrible event, and we present it in all of its brutality and all of its fullness. It was not a turning point in the sense that the Commonwealth actually, by the end of the 17th century, which was a century of war, the Commonwealth rebounded and Jewish communities renewed themselves and the nobility invited Jews to come back to their towns. And what we do is we zoom in from that big picture of the big Commonwealth, the, the, uh, the big population, the rise of civilization, we zoom in on what we call the Jewish town and we set it in the second half of the 17th century and in the 18th century, because this is a very, very distinctive form of settlement, largely, largely in Polish noble, privately owned towns where Jews were invited to settle, and wherever they settled, which was mainly in towns and cities, they formed a very substantial part of the population. In my, own, my father's town uh, during the 1930s, 65% of the town, the town is of, Pat of Patov, of Apt, 65% of the town was Jewish. Bialystok, before the war, 70% was Jewish. Warsaw, a third, a third of the city was Jewish. Uh, Łódź, um, Lodz, 25%. Krakow, 25%. So it meant that although Jews, for example, in the interwar years, were maybe only 10% of the total Polish population, where they settled, they formed 30, 40, 60, 70, or more percent. And so the, these towns acquired, if you will, a Jewish character. So we, we, we call this gallery, which comes after the Chmelitsky uprising, we call it the Jewish town. And what we're interested in is everyday life, the unique, distinctive form of Jewish settlement and a Jewish way of life that is created when you have a critical mass of Jews living together in these towns. And a, we're probably the only museum of Jewish history that has a church because we're interested in the changing relationship of the church and the Jews in this period, which is an interesting story. And we set the story of Jacob Frank, one of the false messiahs, uh, actually in the church because of the disputations that he undertook with his rabbinical opponents. There were two of them, each of them in a cathedral. And of course, the highlight of our Jewish town gallery, which is a reconstruction of the painted ceiling and timber-framed roof of the wooden synagogue that once stood in Gwoździec, which is today in Ukraine, but was in Poland. And we take this really as a, as a, a kind of icon of our story of the, um, if you will, the, the richness um, and the, uh, if you will, full color 
of the history of Polish Jews as lived. And the, uh, there were hundreds of painted synagogues, wood wooden synagogues, beautiful wooden synagogues in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. And they were documented, photographed. This is the best documented one. And they, all of them basically were destroyed by, by the time uh, I would say the war was over. Uh, some of them were destroyed during World War I as a casualty simply of war. Others were destroyed uh, during World War II. And this particular one was documented uh, during the 1890s up until 1914. It was destroyed during the First World War. And we reconstructed it in a very, very beautiful and very interesting way that I think of as the gold standard in museum education. And that is, we worked with uh, Hans House Studio, an uh, educational studio in Massachusetts, and we rallied more than 300 volunteers, students from Israel, Poland, Europe, um, North America, and using traditional tools, techniques, and materials, we not only created this structure, but we also recovered the knowledge of how to build it by using traditional tools, materials, and techniques. And we did that at an open-air museum, and we did it in workshops all across Poland. So we, in essence, created a new kind of object. It weighs about 25 tons. We made the wood framing in an open-air Skansen museum in the south of Poland, and we constructed it, took it apart, numbered the parts, brought them to Warsaw. It's put together with wooden pegs, reassembled it, and then, in the museum, hoisted it and suspended it from cables. This is the original uh, wooden synagogue in Gwoździec, the exterior of it, um, and they're, they're just magnificent structures, but they're a beautiful expression of the symbiosis of Polish and Jewish culture. Because one of our messages is that the history of Polish Jews, uh, it, essentially, it's an, we call it an integral or integrated history in the sense that the history of Poland is not complete without the history of Polish Jews and that the history of Polish Jews can't be understood um, other than in a relationship with all of those among whom they lived. And so this is the kind of documentation that we worked from, uh, architectural drawings, uh, photography, and um, this is how we reassembled this structure and hoisted it, and you can see that it's actually suspended from these cables. It's a really extraordinary object. It comes all the way up into the space, and then around it is the whole story of how we actually uh, created it. I think that from an educational point of view, it was very important that we engaged all these students. This is, I believe, in the White Stork Synagogue in uh, Wrocław, and we painted each section of this beautiful painted ceiling in a different masonry synagogue in a different town in Poland, with the idea being to engage local inhabitants in towns where, in some cases, Jews do live there, but in most cases, there's no, there are no Jews living in those towns, but to engage the local inhabitants of those towns it, to take an interest and a pride in the synagogue that stands in their town and in the Jewish past of their town. So this was not just the making or the reconstruction of an object, this was an educational project and a social action to really demonstrate what we mean by the museum as an agent of transformation. And so visitors who now come, there's a documentation all the way around on the upper level, which we think is, and, and, and we find that the, even the youngest visitors are fascinated by it. Okay, so the end of the 18th century, by 1772, this enormous country is decentralized, weak army, and the nobility uh, are basically in control, mainly interested in their own local interests, and Austria, Russia, and Prussia look at the Commonwealth, and they each, they say, the time has come, we're going to each take a piece of the royal cake. And the Commonwealth is divided, it's partitioned, and the Kingdom of Prussia and the Russian Empire and the Austrian Empire each take a piece. And that's how we begin the story of the long 19th century. Now, this is a beautiful example of what we mean by a theater of history, which is the telling of the story in space, and not simply through objects in vitrines or images mounted on the wall. It's the creating of a total environment like in a theater that the whole environment is telling the story. And the beauty of this also is that this, these spaces can accommodate uh, relatively large groups of visitors, 20 people, 25, 30, even 40, because on, on the one hand, some will sit on these thrones around the table and explore how the country was partitioned and all the new laws and regulations. 
Others can explore the same story in a different way, graphically. Um, uh, very often there are many photo opportunities. This is the empty throne of the last king of Poland. I cannot tell you how many visitors seat themselves on the throne for a photo opportunity. Um, and so the story is told, that, so it's a story really of the partitioning, the outcome, the outcome of the partitions, and it sets up the 19th century. These uh, autonomous Jewish communities that we saw in the Jewish town gallery, that we saw in the first half of the Commonwealth, that's over. Now Jews are subjects, individual subjects of the emperor or of the king, and they're now subject to lifting of some regulations and the imposition of many, many new ones. And we call this gallery Encounters with Modernity, and we, we look for ways to engage all of our visitors, our youngest visitors, our oldest visitors, and we find that um, things that we design for kids, adults love them. It's as if kids give them permission to have a good time with interactivity and with various other elements of our, of our exhibition. We look at the ideological debates around this new situation, whether Jews could in fact become full citizens, and uh, we look at the responses of Jews on the ground by tracing the transformations of the Jewish wedding in the course of the 19th century. And we have beautiful material for using that one example to show how these new laws and regulations not only impose new conditions, conscription, marriage age, language, education, uh, and, and uh, dress reform, but also how Jews responded to them, not only um, in an organized way, but also on the ground in everyday life. We come to the middle of the gallery and we sense change, we, we sort of shift gears. By the mid-century, with the coming of the railroad and the role of Jewish entrepreneurs and financiers in the creating of the railroad, with, I'm thinking of um, Leopold Cronenberg, of Jan Bloch, of Hermann Epstein, we, in a sense, we, we launch the story of industrialization, urbanization, of population explosion, and it's, a, uh, it's, a, uh, it's here where, if you will, there's a kind of intensification of what we call encounters with modernity. It's a beautiful multimedia environment of a, if you will, we never do a literal recreation. What this is is an evocative train station that's 360 degrees where this whole story is told in just a few moments quickly, and then you, you enter and you can explore each of these aspects one by one. We come to the end of the 19th century and World War I, and World War I, the empires collapse. And the Ottoman Empire collapses, the Austrian, the Russian, the, uh, uh, Prussia is now part of Germany, and it's a whole new era. And so with the collapse of the empires, the long 19th century comes to an end, and with the formation of the Second Polish Republic, we have two decades, which there are two views of this period. One view is, uh, according to Celia Heller, a sociologist, Jews were, quote, on the, on the edge, on the brink of destruction. But there's another view that says, actually, despite economic hardship and despite rising anti-Semitism, especially after 1935 with the death of Pilsudski, that this was another, it was a second golden age because of the political energy, because of the cultural creativity, because uh, that it, it, was, it, was just an ex it was an extraordinary period for Poland because these were two decades of Polish independence after 120 years of partition and before occupation and before communism, in other words, until 1989. So this is a very short, intense, and important, and interesting period. And what we've done is to set it on a street, and we call the gallery on the Jewish street, which we take from the Yiddish phrase, after Yiddish Gas, which means, if you were to say in Yiddish, what's doing on the Jewish street, it means what's doing in the Jewish world. So it's not literally a Jewish street, it's, it's an interwar year street, but any main commercial street would have had Jewish businesses, pretty much across Poland. So we have this double height, beautiful relief surface on which we have projected an interwar years street. And in this short period, we have four thematic areas on either side of the street. We have politics, culture, growing up, because youth was a huge preoccupation, and everyday life across the length and breadth of Poland. And so here in the case of politics, uh, what's interesting for us is that Jews were very interested in politics. They were very active in elections. 
They were Jewish parliamentarians. They were Jewish representatives in the Polish parliament. Uh, but the greatest achievement, the greatest achievement of Jewish political parties was not electoral. Although they did, they did elect MPs, they did, uh, they did succeed to some degree in municipal elections, but their greatest achievement was the social and cultural world that they offered their followers. And so we take the three main parties, the Zionist party, which was unique in reaching out to every segment of society and every political persuasion, the Aguda, which interestingly had to adopt a modern method, namely a political party to defend tradition, and of course the Bund, the Jewish labor movement. And we present not only the electoral story, but, the, but for us what's even more important is the social and cultural story. The cultural story, what's interesting here is that in the interwar years, in the 20s and 30s, in Poland, um, up to more than 30% of the population was not ethnically Polish. They were Belarusian, Ukrainian, German, Jewish. Jews were, as I said earlier, 10% of the population. And for, for a, a variety of reasons, it was uh, the, uh, the, the phenomenon of official national minorities was uh, implemented, which is to say that with at the end of World War I and the Peace Treaty of Versailles, these national minorities wanted to be sure that their rights would be protected, that they could have their own schools, speak their own language, and so there were clauses attached to the peace treaty, and th th those clauses, they were called the national minority clauses, and that protected also, among others, Jews as, an, as a recognized national minority. Now, of course, better in theory than in practice, but what it did mean is that you had a flowering of the Jewish press in Yiddish, to some degree in Hebrew, but also a Jewish press in Polish. And it might be interesting that the most important Jewish daily in Polish was Zionist. And I once asked my father, why? Well, he said, because my father was, um, my family Zionist, my father uh, in Poland, my father said, well, he said, when we would get together in our youth group for Hachshara or whatever it was, he said, uh, you know, we didn't want to speak Yiddish and our Hebrew wasn't good enough. So we spoke Polish. And in fact, the Nasz Przeglond, which was this very, very important Jewish newspaper in Polish, was Zionist in its, in its uh, political leaning. We bring our visitors to the upper level. Now, if you're on a short visit, you probably won't get to that second level. But honestly, the second level is my personal favorite. And I'll tell you why. The interwar years is a period of what I would call the making, the making of a new generation, of the, if you will, Second Polish Republic generation, a new generation. Most Jewish children during the interwar years went to Polish public schools. And they went to Polish public schools because the Jewish private schools, and there were Jewish private schools, there were, uh, my, my grandmother helped to form the Tarbut school in Apatuf in, our, in her hometown. There were uh, Jewish uh, private schools, uh, Zionist ones, uh, Yiddish ones, of course, the, from, the, from the Aguda, from the religious ones as well. But for the Jewish private schools, you had to pay, and most families couldn't afford to pay. So they sent their kids to the Polish public schools, and then many cases to a Jewish after school. So what that meant is you have now for the first time a generation raised in at least Polish public schools and who are really truly a new generation. And there was an enormous interest and investment in youth, in new methods of childcare, in new forms of pedagogy, and a real concern for the future and the well-being of youth. And that's the story that we tell in the section called Growing Up, and we tell it largely through autobiographies written more than 600 autobiographies written by youth, Jewish youth, between the ages of around 14, 15, and maybe 2021. 20, the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research organized three autobiography contests during the 1930s. The last one was in 1939. And those autobiographies, which are in Hebrew, in Yiddish, and in Polish, they are extraordinary. They're kind of, if you will, memoirs of half a life. And in those autobiographies, these young people really pour out their hearts. And we're able to use those autobiographies and quotes from them to communicate what was it like to grow up in Poland during the interwar years. And that story of growing up, and here we're showing you the four uh, main school systems. 
and you can open these desks, and we have the, the Hebrew, the modern Hebrew school system, the Yiddish school system, the Orthodox, and the Jewish schools in Polish. So um, we think it's a, this, it's a really a, a beautiful installation, but it's only one of a whole set from childhood all the way to youth groups and to youth clubs at the end of the cycle, the beginning of adulthood. And on the other side, uh, we have a very, very beautiful presentation of everyday life across the length and breadth of Poland <laughs> using Lankentenish, or uh, Know Your Own Land, hiking and exploration as a way of trying to create a sense of rootedness and a sense of one, of one country. And the Jewish version of it is really, really fascinating. We come to the Holocaust Gallery, and we have a very special, uh, I think, and a very unique approach to presenting the Holocaust. And what I would say is that the, the gift that we can offer to those that you will bring to Israel, uh, pardon me, to Poland, the gift that we can offer is to place the Holocaust within a 1,000 year history of Polish Jews. Because generally speaking, Holocaust education situates the Holocaust within the history of Nazism and within the history of anti-Semitism. If you go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, which I think is a wonderful museum, I think it's superb, uh, there'll be a thousand year history of anti-Semitism, but not a thousand year history of Polish Jews, European Jews, German Jews, and the Holocaust within that history. Now what's very important to us in the way in which we present the history of Polish Jews, it's very, very important for us that we do not treat the interwar years or the thousand year history as a, a lead up to the inevitable, which was genocide. There was nothing in the history of Polish Jews that made genocide inevitable. And it's therefore very, very important for us to have our visitors stay in the moment. Now, the story of what happened in the 30s, the rise of Hitler, the Anschluss, everything that happened in Europe, for us, that's a 20s and 30s story, and we tell that and present that in the interwar year gallery. When we come to the end of the street, when we come to the end of the street, when you look down the street, you don't see the Holocaust. You see these people looking up, and you don't know what they're looking up at until you turn left, you turn the corner. Then you see what they're looking up at. And who are they? This is the American ambassador and his staff standing outside the American embassy about to evacuate after the Germans have just invaded. So our story, of the, it, it, our, our Holocaust gallery begins September 1st, 1939, with the German invasion of Poland and officially the beginning of World War II. And we tell the story completely within the borders of occupied Poland, we look inside to see precisely what happened within occupied Poland, and standing in occupied Poland, we look out. And we ask ourselves, what did people in occupied Poland know or see or hear and do, and particularly how did news of what was happening outside come in? So it's a very particular approach, a unique approach, an approach very specific to our museum and to our, uh, our story, so to speak. And I think in that way, it's quite different from what visitors who have had the opportunity to visit Yad Vashem or the Holocaust Museum or the Memorial de la Shoah in Paris, it's, a, it's quite different. And I think that that's important. All those multiple perspectives are really important. And this is the perspective that we are able to offer. Now, um, let, let me just go back here because I need to explain the diagram. Um, our story starts with the invasion, first of all, the occupation by the Germans, two weeks later, the occupation by the Soviets, and we established right at the very beginning that Poland was occupied by two powers. And then we, we, we basically uh, go to the general gouvernement, to the part that the Germans occupied, and follow that story. Now, it's here in this gallery that we are at our most site-specific, because we're standing on the site of the Warsaw Ghetto, and we are facing the Warsaw, the, the monument to the, to the ghetto heroes. And so, and, as we tell this story, we've actually made the, the, the ghetto itself a focal point, and consistent with our approach, we'd rather take one case and develop it than many, many cases and give little bits and pieces from many of them. So it's a kind of pars pro toto approach, and if you take one case and develop it well, you can actually illuminate the larger phenomenon of the ghetto. Now, mind you, of course, the Warsaw Ghetto was the largest. But 
uh, many of these ghettos, you could say, were unique. The Lodz ghetto was unique. The Vilna ghetto was unique. The Warsaw ghetto was unique. And, so, and, and here also, we have a very special approach. So what we do is we take our visitors, first of all, uh, the, what we call the prologue, the, uh, the, the invasion, the occupation, then separa separation, isolation, into the Warsaw ghetto, and the first part, we look at life in the shadow of death, how, how Jews in the ghetto tried to survive and maintain a sense of their humanity under dehumanizing conditions. We then bring our visitors up across a bridge that is inspired by the one that, of a wooden footbridge that uh, joined the larger part of the ghetto with the smaller one across Chodna Street so that the traffic in the city could flow uh, beneath and then to an area that we call a life in the face of death, so the Great Deportation, and then the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And that, that's the first, if you will, the first third of the way in which we present the Holocaust in this gallery. We then take our visitors out, uh, from, out from the, the story of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and they find themselves on the, what we call the Aryan Street, meaning the space outside the ghetto, which they will have seen from this upper level, from the bridge, and now they will see from below. And it's here that we explore the relationship of Poles and Jews during this period. And what I'd like to stress is that this is a history museum, that the commemorative aspect is the monument, but that in the history museum itself, we try to really be authoritative without being authoritarian, which is to say that we want to bring the best scholarship uh, and we've been working with an academic team of Israeli historians, American and Polish, and that we're prepared to confront the most difficult issues in a way that's candid and open and hopefully create trust in our visitors so that they will be willing to debate them, consider them, and discuss them with greater, if you will, context, greater depth and greater understanding and with cross-audience dialogue. And so we explored Polish-Jewish relations and we look specifically um, at ways n not only organized uh, responses in the form of, of um, Zagota, the or which is I think absolutely unique in terms of occupied Europe for there to have been an organization, a department within the underground specifically to help Jews, the efforts of individuals, uh, some of whom uh, also died with those they hid, others who betrayed, and others who uh, somehow manage also to survive. And then, of course, the Shoah proper and the, the death camps, and then we come out to the final section, which is specifically about uh, the post-war years. So first of all, separation, isolation, the forming of 600 ghettos in the occupied territory, the focus on the Warsaw Ghetto with two narrators, Chernyakov, head of the Judenrat, Ringelblum, head of the Oynik Shabbos archive, the clandestine secret archive to document everything that was going on in the Warsaw Ghetto. And we actually build the narrative, uh, particularly the Warsaw Ghetto, largely from the materials in the Ringelblum archive, which is today at the Jewish Historical Institute, and that was recovered from the rubble of the ghetto uh, immediately after the war. And then these thematic sections and the Aryan side and then we come to the post-war years. I should say this, that one of the things that we, I think, do in a way that's quite unique in the Holocaust Gallery is that we try very much to stay inside the period and, in a sense, maintain the short horizon forward of those in the story itself. And so we only use documents and materials from the period itself that were created at the moment and on the very spot. The post-war years gallery extends from the end of the war to the very present, and it begins really with the return, uh, coming out of hiding, returning from the Soviet Union, coming out of the concentration camps of Jews who came back to Poland. So of the 3,300,000 Jews living in Poland before the war, about 300,000 came back to Poland and either you know, stayed for a short time and then some stayed until, well, basically stayed. And the, uh, most, of, most Jews, most Polish Jews serve, who did survive, survived in the Soviet Union. They survived really by, uh, by deportation, as, 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 as some have said. Very few survived in hiding, and then some came back from concentration camps. And uh, between 45 and 48, or 47, between 45 and 48, about half of them actually left, most left for, first for Palestine and then later for Israel. 
And our, the, there are two main ideas that organize this post-war gallery. The first is the big question, to stay or to leave? And the second is, in a sense, the, pre the question, or if you will, the, um, the paradox of the present moment, which we say is small numbers, big presence. That the number of Jews in Poland today is relatively small by any measure, but Jewish presence in Polish consciousness is huge. And so those are the two big ideas that organize this gallery. <coughs> to stay or to leave, and the galleries organize that on one side is the story of leaving, on the other side is the story of staying. And the story of staying, first of all, what it meant uh, for Jews to live under communism, and the story of leaving. <coughs> and of course, the story of leaving, the last uh, big outflow uh, was as a result of the anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic campaign of, uh, n of 1968. And uh, as a result of it, um, I would say that uh, 15,000 Jews left, about 10,000 Jews stayed, and there's a period uh, between 68 and 89 of the rise of the opposition and the beginnings, the beginnings of the renewal of Jewish life, and that really, uh, really picks up steam after the fall of communism in 1989. And we opened our, our, our doors to the public in 2013 and had our grand opening in 2014, and the response has been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, we've had a uh, wonderful response from the public with large numbers of visitors, and uh, we've had wonderful response also in the media, uh, in not only in Poland and in Israel, but also internationally. And most of all, we look forward to welcoming you and hoping that you will include us in your itineraries and that a visit to our museum will help to frame in a completely fresh, new, and interesting way the entire visit to Poland. Thank you.